How's everybody doing? Good weekend? Yeah. Sunny? Yeah. I thought the same thing. I discovered I had, um, when I was up, had the thing up earlier, I had figures for this material, and I think I uploaded the wrong file that doesn't have the figures. Did you guys get the figures for, for today's lecture earlier? No? Okay, I apologize. I thought I had those up there. So I will um, get those posted this evening. I, I thought I had them up there, but I've made them, but I haven't, I, haven't, I guess I must have made a bad length in terms of getting them up there. So I'll get them up to you, and um, you'll have them. So um, today I'm going to um, hopefully finish up talking about DNA replication. And last time I had a little bit of a hurried lecture, and so it took a little um, uh, while getting through some of that material. Today I'm going to slow down a little bit and um, hopefully get you a little better understanding about what's happening during the replication of DNA. One of the points I made last time that I want to really emphasize, because uh, I think it's critical to understanding what's going on, is that DNA replication absolutely can only occur in the five prime to three prime direction. Absolutely only, no ifs, ands, no buts. Right? Has to occur in the five prime to three prime direction. Okay? Now, the fact that the strands are anti-parallel, meaning one strand is going five prime to three prime this way, and one strand is going five prime to three prime this way, means that the replication that occurs on each strand is going to be different. And that's what I was referring to when I talked last time about the leading and the lagging strands of replication. Okay? So let's refresh our memories um, here just a little bit. And that is not that. This shows the five prime and three prime nature of things. Well, here is the leading and lagging strand replication. Now, as I said, leading strand replication occurs in one piece. It doesn't occur in multiple pieces. It starts, it goes five prime to three prime, and it's copying a strand that is three prime to five prime, so it's doing just fine. It's completely happy. It doesn't have to do anything except move forward. The other strand, on the other hand, when it gets replicated, it can only get replicated when this strand opens up a new section that can be replicated. So when a new section of this bottom strand gets opened up, then the polymerase can start a new one. And so what you see in each one of these fragments is a place where the replication fork got opened up and a new segment of strand was opened up and the polymerase copied and you'll notice it's going from right to left. Okay? So that's the only way that the lagging strand can get made. The lagging strand pieces are called Okazaki fragments. And this replication scheme that I'm showing you is true in all cells on the face of the Earth. It's true for essentially any DNA virus as well. All right? So cells, DNA viruses, all replicate by this very, very common mechanism that we see. There's more complexity to it than what you see up here. It actually does something like what you see on the bottom, but you don't even have to worry about that for our purposes. Okay? Um, as I said, I encourage you to go look up some of the YouTube videos that are out there because they really show this in some very nice detail and show you a lot of the complexity of what's going on. When I finished last time, I was telling you about this amazing protein called helicase. So there are several proteins that are present at the replication fork that we need to understand. DNA polymerase is only one of those polymerase. I'm going to say more about DNA polymerase later today. Okay? There's several considerations for it. And it's an interesting and unusual enzyme. As we will see, most cells have more than one DNA polymerase. All right. Well, helicase, I told you, was a protein. It's located right here at the very front of the replication fork. And its job is to unwind strands. That's what it does. It unwinds strands, and it does it with amazing proficiency. That's the, the protein that I was talking about that was spinning at 6,000 RPM, peeling strands apart. Okay? 6,000 revolutions per minute to get those strands apart to support the replication that the polymerase is uh, going to do. Okay? All right, so that's a pretty remarkable thing that these enzymes are doing. All right? Now, let's talk about some of the other enzymes that are present at the replication fork. Okay? One of the enzymes of the replication fork is actually not right at it. It's actually a little bit ahead of the replication fork. It's up in this area up here. Okay? 
In this area ahead, and actually I'm going to go to another figure to show you this. In this area ahead of the replication fork, um, here. we see several things. Now this isn't drawn very much to scale. The other, protein, uh, the other proteins that I'm talking about are ones called DNA gyrase. I would put it more like up over here to the right. It's not sitting right square on there. It's more like over here. Okay? DNA gyrase is an enzyme that we call a topoisomerase, T-O-P-O-I-S-O-M-E-R-A-S-E, -O -O -E -E. topoisomerase. A topoisomerase has a very interesting property. It basically untangles DNA. It untangles DNA. Well, why do we have to have something tang untangling DNA? That would suggest that DNA gets tangled and the answer is DNA definitely gets tangled. Okay? How does it get tangled? Well, if I start peeling these strands apart with a helicase right here at 6,000 RPM, and I don't do anything else, down here this guy is going to get all scrunched up. Take the rubber band and play the game and you'll see it gets tied up very quickly. The DNA can't be in a knot. The polymerase can't work, other functions can't work. So to relieve that tension, that arises from peeling these strands apart with the helicase is doing, the DNA gyrase, again, which is a topoisomerase, same, same thing, is relieving that tension. It's basically cutting the DNA and allowing that tension to release, and then it reseals it again. That's what it's doing, cutting it apart, letting the tension out, and then putting it back together. Cutting it, letting the tension out, putting it back together. It's doing that periodically so that the DNA does not end up in a knot, okay? All right, so we've got a DNA polymerase, we've got a DNA gyrase, and we've got a helicase. What else do we have? Well, one of the things that we have is very interesting. It's right, um, actually located right, where is it at? Right here, all right? And this is an enzyme that's associated with the helicase, but it's not the helicase itself. It's called a primase, P-R-I-M-A-S-E. And a primase is an enzyme that is necessary for the DNA polymerase to get started. Now, this is another oddity of the DNA polymerase. Right? DNA polymerases, when I talked about making these strands of DNA the other day, I didn't tell you the whole, the whole story. The whole story is a DNA polymerase cannot, underlying not, start synthesizing a strand on its own. It cannot start synthesizing a strand on its own. It can only extend a strand that has already been started. Well, if it can't start a strand on its own, that means something else has to start it. The something else that starts it is primase. What primase does is it makes a short stretch of RNA. Notice I said RNA. It makes a short stretch of RNA. It reads the other strand just like a DNA polymerase does. It makes a short strand of RNA, and that short strand of RNA is what the DNA polymerase extends. All right? So, we have um, not very good examples here. But the DNA polymerase is extending something whenever it's taking something from an existing piece, like you see here in purple, and moving it and, and continuing to polymerize and move it forward. That's what extending means. It's making a new strand and it's extending an existing one. The existing one that it's extending at the very beginning is an RNA made by primase. Okay? In this case, we see the primer right here that was already extended to make that. Okay, We can see the primer that the DNA polymerase extended and extended this little purple piece right here. We see similar here. Here's a primer. Here's a polymerase actively synthesizing a new strand from the primer as we go along there. Okay. So primase is critical. Primase is an example of an enzyme that we refer to as an RNA polymerase, meaning it reads DNA, but it makes RNA, and it uses the same base pairing rules 
that the DNA polymerase does, except remember that RNA, we use U instead of T. Okay. So we have a primase that's down here doing its thing. All right. What else do we have on here? Well, one of my personal favorites is this yellow guy right here. All right. The yellow guy right there is something that we call a beta clamp. A beta clamp. What is a beta clamp? Well, a beta clamp has a very simple function. It has a very simple structure. Let me show you the structure. Okay? The beta clamp looks like this. Okay? It is a ring. That's a protein. It's a protein that's a ring. And in the middle, that's a DNA. That is a DNA right square in the middle. Well, what, what is it doing, and why is it doing just that? All right? Where'd my thing go? Wait, there we go. Okay. That's what it looks like from the side. There's the DNA in the middle of that sticking through. Here's all the other stuff. Okay. Well, why do we have uh, something like that? What's, what's, what's its function? Well, if I go back to my um, replication fork. I keep losing my place. Here we go. Okay. It turns out that the DNA polymerase that's here, okay, and by the way, this is called DNA polymerase 3, is what it's called. There's 1 and 2, and I'll talk about those in a bit. But this is called DNA polymerase 3. Okay. DNA polymerase 3, if we just take it and we mix it with some DNA and we give it a primer and we give it some nucleotides and we say, go ahead and replicate, it will. It'll go on for, oh, a couple of hundred bases it'll put in, and then it'll fall off of the DNA. It will fall off. DNA polymerases don't have an ability to cling tightly to the DNA. All right? Well, there's only four or five DNA polymerase threes in an E. coli cell. Very small number. We don't have them floating everywhere. The, 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 the E. coli cell doesn't have them floating everywhere where they're available. So the E. coli cell wants to hold the polymerase onto the DNA once it gets started. And that's the function of the beta clamp. The beta clamp comes out like this. Here's a DNA, and it goes click. And it makes that, that, that link around it. So it makes that circle that you saw in the structure. Well, when it's made that circle, there's nothing that's going to fall off of that. The DNA can't get out. It can slide along, but it can't fall out. Okay. To the beta clamp, that's where the DNA polymerase 3 gets attached. So when the DNA polymerase 3 is attached to the beta clamp, as you see it is here, the DNA polymerase does not fall off of the DNA. It stays on it for the entire replication cycle. It stays on it for the entire replication cycle. We refer to that property as being processive, meaning that once it gets on, it stays on. Rather like the rodeo rider with the bronching bull. It stays on. And it stays on because of the beta clamp. OK. Uh, we've got a couple more things here that are important. All right? One is this guy labeled here SSB. I can think of a lot of nasty things that might mean, but it actually stands for single strand binding protein. Everybody smiled at that one. Okay. Single strand binding protein. What does single-strand binding protein do? Single-strand binding protein's function is to protect single-stranded DNAs. That's really important because you see that there are regions here where it's single-stranded before the polymerase is getting a chance to do its thing. And if we have a break or the, the E. coli cell has a break in that single strand, it can't put the pieces back together again. Humpty Dumpty, right? So single-strand binding protein helps to protect single strands. That's one of its functions. It turns out it also helps the polymerase a little bit too. Okay? We won't go into that. But suffice it to say, single strand binding protein is essential for the replication of the E. coli DNA. Okay. In fact, all these things are essential. All right, I'm down to my last two. One is something called DNA ligase. All right? DNA ligase. When we think about li ligase, that suggests ligation, and ligation means tying things together. 
A DNA ligase is important because remember on the, the lagging strand, what do we have? We have Okazaki fragments. The DNA is not in one continuous piece. We have to join those fragments together, but there's a problem. What's the problem? We've got RNA at the start of every one of these because that's where the primer put the, the primates put the primer down, right? In order to get rid of the RNA, it takes another DNA polymerase called DNA polymerase 1. What does DNA polymerase 1 do? I'm going to say a little bit more about it in just a minute, but briefly I'll tell you what it does. It chews out the RNA and replaces it with DNA. Now, even when it's done that, the little pieces still haven't been tied together. The little pieces are still little pieces. What does it take to tie them together? That's what the DNA ligase does. DNA ligase joins all those little pieces together once the RNAs have been removed. Now, when DNA ligase is done, you have a completely intact strand on the lagging strand. You have a completely intact strand on the leading strand. Question? Okay, so what is the thing that, that chewed out the RNA and replaced it with DNA? That's an enzyme known as DNA polymerase 1. Okay? So DNA polymerase 1 and DNA polymerase 3 have very different functions. I'm going to say something about them in just, just a couple minutes. Okay, that, amazingly enough, constitutes the proteins involved in an E. coli replication fork. Yes, sir? So DNA polymerase 1 has an activity associated with it that we call an exonuclease, and I'm going to say a little bit about that. It has an exonuclease activity associated with it. That's correct. Yes, sir? Okay, so the trait, what's the trait for when the polymerase stays on the DNA for a long period of time? That's called processive. Processive. P-R-O-C-E-S-S-I-V-E. -E. Processive. Okay? Other questions? It's a lot of proteins. There's a lot of complexity here, and what's remarkable is how rapidly this whole process goes along. A thousand nucleotides a second in E. coli. Pretty hard to fathom. Okay, um, let's see. Let's talk about the DNA polymerase. I'm going to go back and talk about the DNA polymerases now. All right. There, it turns out there are five polymerases in E. coli. We really only talk about three of them, and in fact, I'm only going to talk about two of them, polymerase 1 and polymerase 3. I'm not going to expect you're going to memorize this table because it doesn't really tell us uh, very much. Okay. But these Enzymes do have some different properties that are summarized down below that I am going to tell you about. Okay? Well, let's see. What can I tell you? So if we look at how fast they work, we see they're very different. Turnover number per minute, meaning 600 nucleotides a minute. Here's polymerase 3 working about 1,000 per minute. Processivity, the tendency to stay onto a DNA. Polymerase 1 stays on for about 200 nucleotides. Polymerase 3 stays on for over half a million. Polymerase 3 works with a beta clamp. Polymerase 1 does not work with a beta clamp. Big difference that beta clamp makes right there. Okay? All right. Now, what I want to focus on is talking about these things down here at the bottom. Polymerase, polymerization, exonuclease, exonuclease. Okay. Now, both of these enzymes are DNA polymerases. Polymerase 1, in fact, all three of these enzymes are DNA polymerases. They all will make DNA. They all will make DNA. The one that is the most abundant is actually polymerase 1. The one that's the least abundant is actually polymerase 3. The reason that 3 is so unabundant or so rare in the cell is because once it gets started, you don't need to add any more. It just keeps going and going like the Ever Ready Bunny. It keeps going and going. Okay. There's only one DNA to be, to be replicated, so that's, that, that, that takes care of that very nicely. Well, what activities do they have? When I say activities, when we say an enzyme, what we've been talking about so far is an enzyme is something that catalyzes a reaction. Some enzymes can catalyze more than one reaction. And DNA polymerases typically will catalyze more than one reaction. 
Okay? Well, the reaction that they all catalyze is they make DNA in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. That's this line that says polymerization 5' prime to 3'. Prime. It does. Okay? Well, not surprisingly, that they're named DNA polymerases. They should be making DNA. And as I told you before, all DNA is made in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. So that sort of makes sense. Okay? Oop, and there's a typo there. That should say 3 to 5. Um, right there. That, that should be 3 to 5. I just noticed that. Okay? That should be 3' prime to 5', prime, not 5' prime to 3'. Prime. Otherwise, these two are identical. And that doesn't tell you very much, does it? Okay. So this line should be 3' prime to 5' prime right here. All right. Now, 3' prime to 5' prime exonuclease. What does that mean? Well, first of all, what does an exonuclease mean? The term exonuclease, its name tells us something about what it does. Exo, meaning outside of. Nuclease, meaning breaking a, down a nucleic acid. So this is an enzyme that works on the end of a nucleic acid, on the end of a nucleic acid, and chews backwards. That is, it removes nucleotides in the 3' prime to 5' prime direction. That's the opposite direction from which the DNA polymerase was working. OK? 3' prime to 5' prime exonuclease works backwards from the direction that the polymerase was working. OK. I'm going to come back and talk about that in a minute. Let's focus on the next exonuclease. A 5' prime to 3' prime exonuclease, the one at the bottom. First of all, let's see. 3' prime to 5' prime, I'm sorry, I said it backwards. The bottom one's 3' prime to 5' prime. Sorry. Sorry. It's Monday. OK. 3' prime to 5' prime is the one on the bottom, not the one, not the one next to the bottom. Okay, 3' prime to 5'. The reason I say that is all these DNA polymerases have a 3' prime to 5' prime exonuclease. I'll explain the significance of that in a minute. But I want to talk about the 5' prime to 3' prime exonuclease that we can see only polymerase 1 has. So what does a 5' prime to 3' prime exonuclease do? It works very much like a 3' prime to 5' prime, except for it works in the same direction as DNA is being made. 5 prime to 3 prime. It starts at an end and it moves inwards. It's this 5 prime to 3 prime exonuclease of DNA polymerase 1 that removes the RNA primer. It sits down at the front end of the RNA primer. It sits at the 5 prime end of it and it moves forwards, chewing out nucleotides and then filling that gap back in with a DNA polymerase. Okay? So the 5' prime to 3' prime exonuclease of DNA polymerase 1 removes the RNA primers that have been put onto the DNA fragments by primase. OK. Am I clear on that? I apologize for mixing those two up. Yes, question. So 5' prime to 3' prime exonuclease activity is not in polymerase 3, it's not in polymerase 1. Uh, in polymerase 2, that's right. It's only in polymerase 1. Yes? At the beginning of every Okazaki fragment, is there RNA because of Good question. At the front of every Okazaki fragment, is there an RNA due to the primase? And the answer is yes, there is. Every single piece of DNA starts out as an RNA. Yep. OK. Well, what's this 3' prime to 5' prime um, exonuclease activity, this guy down here that they all have? What is it? And why is it important? Well, this activity turns out to be pretty cool. It's something that we call proofreading. Hopefully, before you submit a paper, you proofread it, right? More commonly, you probably stick it in your spell checker. If the spell checker get, doesn't get it, then you're, you're hosed. But hopefully, you're proofreading before you turn in your paper, right? When you write a long paper. Well, proofreading helps you to check and see if there are errors and then fix those errors if they're there. DNA polymerase has a proofreader of its own. I'm going to explain how it works. Let's imagine that the DNA polymerase is moving along and it's copying a strand. On the top strand, it sees a T. On the bottom, it puts an A. On the top, it sees a G. On the bottom, it puts a C. On the top, it sees a C. It puts in a G. A, T, C, G, A, T, C, A. Right? And all of a sudden, it gets up here, and it sees a G, and it makes a mistake. And instead of putting in a C, it puts in an A. Okay? Now, if it didn't have proofreading, it wouldn't stop. 
it would just keep going and going, and it would now have a mutation that is an error at the place where that A got put in. That will cause a problem down the line. Okay? Well, it turns out that that A doesn't form a very nice base pair. The actual duplex bulges at that point because it just doesn't fit in the helix in the right way that a properly base paired base would. The polymerase at that point will slow down. It physically slows down. Okay? And instead of moving forward, it moves backwards. And when it moves backwards, it starts its exonuclease activity to chew out that three prime most base that was put in. And it chews back for a few bases. That's what it's doing. So when it moves backwards, it's moving three prime to five prime, and it's removing any bases that were around where that error was, including the error itself. Then the polymerase says, okay, let's go forward, and it moves forward and it starts moving forward again, now putting in the proper bases that are in there. This proofreading activity improves DNA replication's um, uh, ability to reduce, uh, to, to, I'm sorry, its, its accuracy, it improves its accuracy by about 100 to 1,000 fold. It improves it by 100 to 1,000 fold. Now, We'll talk later about HIV. HIV has a DNA polymerase, and HIV DNA polymerase does not have proofreading ability. HIV's uh, DNA polymerase turns out to be very what we call error prone, meaning instead of making an error about one in every 10 million bases, it's making an error in probably one in every 100,000 or 10,000 bases. It's going to make a heck of a lot more errors over time than the E. coli polymerase is. And it's because of that that HIV is able to survive. More errors means more mutations. More mutations gives more ability to evade immune systems and also evade drugs targeted at them. Okay? So for a virus, an error-prone DNA polymerase works very, very well in the virus's interest. The more diversity that the virus can throw at a cell, the more likely at least some of those are going to survive and go on and make new viruses. Okay. All right, I'll slow down. I said we're going to slow down. I'll slow down. Take any questions or comments that you might have. Everybody's looking tired. Yes? So HIV has a polymerase of its own called reverse transcriptase. I'll talk about that later. Okay? So it, has, it carries its own DNA polymerase with it. Okay, so that's the story of the DNA polymerases. Um, I guess I just did that, didn't I? Okay. And I look right here. I've already done that. Okay. And proofreading. Okay. So this illustrates for you now what I tried to picture for you in words what's happening in proofreading, okay? Here's the polymerase. It has just accidentally put in a GT base pair. GT base pair doesn't work properly. It doesn't fit properly. And the polymerase has a little chamber. And that little chamber is where the end that doesn't match properly will actually jump into, all right? If it pairs properly, it won't fit in that chamber. But if it doesn't pair properly, it fits in this chamber, and that's a signal to the enzyme uh-oh, we made a mistake, time to back up. And that's when the exonuclease takes over and starts removing things backwards now in the three prime to five prime direction. Okay, let's see. Um, I think that's what I wanna say, all right. So that covers what I wanna say about DNA um, polymerization. Um, 
DNA is the genetic material, and DNA is essential for a cell. We all know that. One of the reasons that cells work, uh, have DNA polymerases that are so accurate, is that without them, we would not have cells. Okay? A living organism like us, if our DNA polymerases is not accurate, or if we do something to damage our DNA polymerases, we make them much more prone to mutation, and I think you know what happens with mutation in an organism like us. You get uncontrolled growth, and uncontrolled growth leads to cancer, and we're all dead. Okay? One of the reasons that we worry about um, uh, the things that we get into our air, or our water, or our food, is that the more of this junk that we take into our bodies in this way, the more likely we are going to foul up our DNA polymerases in the business of copying the DNAs in our cells. I'm going to give you some examples today, and I want you to think very hard about them. Okay? Well, fortunately, we have some repair systems in our body that take care of some of the problems that arise. Okay? I want to emphasize that the repair systems are not infinite. The more we push those repair systems, the more likely we are to make mutations that are going to be problematic for the cell down the line. Okay? All right. So the repair systems that exist in cells, there are several, are there um, and actually do a very nice job uh, of, of what they're expected to to keep things from um, being problematic. Okay? I've just explained to you uh, something about how uh, proofreading itself occurs. Okay? Proofreading, as I said, is very important for maintaining the integrity during the replication process. Okay? Very important during the replication process. If things escape, if errors escape the, the replication process, we've got problems. Well, how might they escape? Well, there's a couple ways they might escape. One is the, the proofreading, even though it's good, isn't perfect. I'm sure when you proofread things, you're not perfect either. You still have errors slip through. DNA polymerases are very good, but they're not perfect. Other ways that errors and problems can arise inside of cells is due to environmental damage or environmental pollutants that cause DNA polymerase to not be accurate. Okay? We all know about smoking. Smoking is a giant uh, problem with respect to cancer. And not surprisingly, smoking introduces damage into the DNAs of our cells. Okay? There are some enormous ugly molecules that will get attached to the DNA simply as a result of breathing cigarette smoke. Those enormous blobs have to be removed by the repair system. And like I said, if we overwhelm the repair system, eventually we're going to have mutation, we're going to have cancer, and not surprisingly, the more you're pushing that repair system in your lungs constantly with smoking, the more likely you are to have mutation come along and cause cancer. There are many things in our lives, though, that lead to mutation that we take for granted. And I'd like to direct this part of the lecture particularly to young people, okay? Young people who go to tanning booths, okay? Going to a tanning booth makes just about as much sense as starting to smoke, okay? It makes just about as much sense as starting to smoke, okay? Why? Because when you go to a tanning booth, what you can see on the screen is what's happening to the DNAs inside of your cells. Okay? You are taking two thiamines that are adjacent to each other, and you are covalently linking them to make something called a thymine dimer. Okay? Thymine dimers have to be repaired by the repair system. The more thymine dimers you make, again, just like the more smoking you do, the more likely you are you're going to overwhelm the repair system and lead to cancer. It's a numbers game. Tanning booths are particularly bad. You say, well, you go out and you get a suntan, you get a sunburn, isn't that bad too? To some extent, yes. But tanning booths, why do you go to tanning booths? You go to tanning booths because you can get a tan in 30 minutes. Right? What's it hitting you with? It's hitting you with a big dose of what the sun would hit you with over several hours, and you're already pushing your repair system just by setting foot in a tanning booth. I see people looking nervously around as I'm telling them that. Okay? Don't go to those stupid things. Okay? It's one of the stupidest possible things that you could do. Yes? 
Um, there's a, a disease called xeroderma pigmentosa that I think you're referring to, uh, where people are very, very UV sensitive. They have, yeah, yeah, they have very, very high sensitivity to uh, UV damage. Yeah. Okay. So my hope is that after this lecture, nobody goes to a tanning booth and that all of you cancel whatever memberships you have. I'm very serious about that, okay? Because you are going to have skin cancer, period. Okay? Yes? S say it again. I, I can't hear you. something the doctors prescribe for you to go to a tanning booth? Yeah. I don't doubt there's doctors that might prescribe things for you to go to a tanning booth, but doctors like to deal with sick people. What's that? <laughs> yeah. So my, 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 point, my point is that doctors are in the business of sick people. So if you want to go and get something from a doctor to go to a tanning booth, they will gladly sell you something to do that. Okay? But that doesn't mean that, you sh that you're okay to go to a tanning booth because you're not. There's nothing you're going to put on a tanning booth that's going to uh, take care of you short of an SPF 50, and then why do you go to the tanning booth in the first place? Okay? So don't do it. That's my bottom line. Okay? All right. So thymine dimers have to be replaced. Thymine dimers um, uh, are uh, essential things that have to be repaired. They're repaired by a re repair system called nucleotide excision. Nucleotide excision repair takes care of thymine dimers. Here's how it works. Okay. You have an, something called an exonuclease that recognizes, you have, you have a system, first of all, that recognizes, hey, we've got a thymine dimer here. Yeah. Yes, nucleotide excision. Uh-huh. Nucleotide excision repair. This ABC exonuclease simply chops out the segment that needs repair, and then DNA polymerase 1 comes in and fills in the gap. All right? Those of you who are at tanning booths are sure hoping you have a lot more of these than you have of these. Because if you don't, then you're going to mutate. Yeah? What happens to this? Anything, any nucleic acids that get... get broken away like this, get bro just get chopped up and get broken down. Yeah. yeah. So for example, in our, in our cells, we frequently are making RNAs and turning them over. And so we have enzymes called nucleases, like the nucleases we're talking about, they just break things down. So they can be recycled, and, that, and that's, that's what they do. But the problem is that they're not recycled and they stay in there. Then when the DNA polymerase comes along and it tries to copy this, it can't copy it. And so what it'll do is it'll make its best guess. That's what happens. It makes its best guess. And I don't know about you, but I don't like the DNA polymerase as guessing as, as, as a determinant of my future. That's not a good idea. OK. Um, another type of repair is called base excision repair. And by the way, I'm just very briefly showing you these. I'm not going to go through the mechanisms in detail. But I think you should know the names and what they do, OK? The names of the, of the repair systems. Base excision repair works on DNA that's been oxidatively damaged. Okay? Oxidatively damaged. And it works in a little bit different way than nucleotide excision repair. In this case, the base is physically removed. Here's a damaged base. Okay? That damaged base might have arisen as a result, for example, of oxidative damage. Oxidative damage. What's oxidative damage? Well, oxidative damage, excuse me, occurs when a reactive oxygen species encounters a base in DNA. A reactive oxygen species encounters a base in DNA. What does that mean? Well, we'll talk about reactive oxygen species later. But reactive oxygen species are basically oxygens with extra electrons. That's what a reactive oxygen species, or an ROS, actually is. Reactive oxygen species. If that reactive oxygen species bumps into, for example, a guanine, it will react with it immediately, and it will make something we call 8-oxoguanine. That's a name you should know, 8-oxoguanine. 
Why should you know that name? Okay. That's a very, what's that? Eight oxo guanine. Is that a question? Oh, spell it. Eight dash O X O dash G U A N I N E. Okay. Eight. What's that? Are you saying A or eight? Eight. The number eight. I'm sorry. Eight. Eight oxo guanine. Yeah. Sorry. All right. So when it hits a guanine, it will react with it. Okay. It can it can do other damage as well, but I'm giving you one specific example. When it hits a guanine. That oxygen will attach to it, and when it attaches to it, you create 8-oxoguanine. Well, why do I keep saying 8-oxoguanine? Right? I say that because this base really is problematic. Instead of base pairing with C like guanine does, this guy will base pair with A. So if it doesn't get removed and polymerase comes along, what happens? Well. The polymerase puts in an A where there should have been a C. Now you've got a problem. Okay? So it's very important that that get removed. Well, this system, this base re excision repair system, is one way of removing it. What it does is it removes the base. Notice it didn't break the strand. It actually removed the base. Then it broke the strand, opened it up, and repaired it. So the difference between base excision repair and nucleotide excision repair is nucleotide excision repair just chopped out the whole piece of DNA and threw it away. Base excision repair chopped out the base and then went in and did the repair. Okay? So they're fundamentally different processes, fundamentally different enzymes that are involved in doing those. Okay. All right. Um, what else do I want to say? Mismatch. This is the last one I'll talk about. Mismatch repair is something like what you've already seen with proofreading. Except for proofreading happened while the polymerase was moving along making the DNA. What if the polymerase didn't catch its mistake? Okay. What if it didn't catch its mistake? Well, there's a backup system called mismatch repair. Here's an example. The polymerase has already gone along its merry way. It's up here. Already done its thing. And there's this mismatch. Okay. The cell knows it's a mismatch because, as you see here, it's a bulge. It doesn't base pair properly. And that bulge says, uh-oh, something's wrong at this point. All right. The bulge turns out to be a target for binding of a protein known as mute H. Okay? Mute H. Okay? That, in turn, recruits other proteins known as mute S, mute L, and they fix the damage. Okay? So you can see a bunch of things have been removed like we saw before and goes and does its thing. Don't worry about the details of this. More important that you know what this process is involved in. This process is involved in fixing errors that escape proofreading. So mismatch repair is involved in fixing errors that escape proofreading. Okay. That's a lot of stuff there. Okay. Now I've got, let's see, do I want to do that or not? Do I hear no? <laughs> How about a song instead? What do you guys think? Okay. All right. So this is a song that I wrote quite a while ago, and um, it describes the process as you've just heard, and I've got some accompaniment to go with that. So let's get the accompaniment going.
Oh, I can't get this. Whoa, we got too many things going on. All right. 